Welcome back to Ammon Answers Podcast. This is Aaron Welling. I'm joined with Ammon Bundy, candidate for governor of Idaho. Welcome back. This is our uh, Ammon Answers Podcast where we're giving answers to the questions that you've sent the campaign. We're going to jump right into this, okay? Sounds good. Let's do it. Um, I'm listening to your latest town halls where you state that Idaho should be a refuge, among other freedoms, to freely practice your religion. There's a follow-up question to that, but I'll... I'll hold off. Well, yeah, I mean, that is something that's been so great about this country is that people can decide what they're going to worship, what they're going to believe. doesn't matter if they decide to worship a yellow dog. They have a right to do that, and no one else has a right to infringe upon that. And um, anyway, I hope that that stays. There has been a lot of attacks on uh, religious liberties in this country. Uh, We saw one here in Idaho in 2020, where people were arrested for going to church under the Governor Little's lockdown orders. And in fact, Idaho was the first state in the in the United States since at least the Civil War in the 1860s to have someone arrested for going to church. And that is an issue and something that all people in government need to understand that you don't have that right to arrest people for worshiping, assembling and 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 deciding what they want to believe in. The only time that the government has a right to act when it comes to anything is if someone is infringing upon another person's rights. So if they're using religion to say that, you know, we're going to, or to kill somebody or hurt somebody or destroy property, then then the government has a right to act and jurisdiction in that matter. And that's not a matter of religion. That's a matter of rights. And so... And they're already on the books. Yeah, they're already on the books. I mean... In fact, I'd love to show them to you. Uh-huh. Uh, I got the Idaho State Constitution here. We know about the First Amendment, which is a, a powerful uh, amendment. But Article 4 says, Guarantee of religious liberties, the exercise and enjoyment of religious faith and worship shall forever be guaranteed, and no person shall be denied any civil or political right, privilege, or capacity on the account of his religious opinion. Now, one other thing, which I, I love this last article in the Idaho Constitution, Article uh, Section 19, and it says, It is ordained by the state of Idaho that perfect toleration of religious sentiment shall be secured, and no inhabitant of stead, said state, that'd be Idaho, shall ever be molested in person or property on account of his or her mode of religious worship. And that's exactly what happened to the people in Moscow under the order of Governor Little, and one of the reasons why I'm running. Nailed it. Second one, this is from Brent via Facebook. How will you handle a food shortage in Idaho if it comes our way? Well, I mean, I, so I'm, I don't believe that the government is supposed to be the one to prepare and to get, you know, I think we need to be prepared. I think they're maybe for a very short period of time be able to have some type of food supply, but um, you're supposed to have your food supply in your homes. You're supposed to be preparing now. Uh, you're responsible for your families. You're responsible for yourself. Uh, you might be able to share with your friends and work together and do that. But now is the time to prepare. And uh, if there's a ton of people that are hungry, uh, there's no state or no uh, institution that's going to be able to handle, you know, mass amount of hundreds of thousands or millions of people that are hungry. The only way to do that is by each individual storing food and and storing a little extra for their neighbor if needed and then we'll get through it that way uh, that's just that's just a practical way that we're going to do that and so uh, anybody who's listening now is the time to prepare um, you need to always be able to have enough food at least for three four months I would say a year or so to be able to feed your family and yourself well I think that's good um, a good point right we we seen some food shortages. People have been alarmed. You know, shelves have been empty at different ports in the past 24 months. We've had right. stock shelves or empty shelves, but right now they're full. And so we should not go hoard, but we should definitely make preparations so that we are self-sustaining. I think they say that it takes about three days to empty the shelves in a, in a grocery store with normal purchases. Mm. So, I mean, they're full and they look full and they look like they're always going to be full, but that's not the reality. There was a situation in, I believe it was in the, in the south, and I don't quote me where, but where a bridge uh, failed and the, 
the trucks had to go way around and um their their grocery stores went completely empty before they can get supplied and uh that's that's a reality so we shouldn't find ourselves in that but yeah the state can do some some things to help but it's not the state's responsibility and now's the time to act okay Here's a fun one. What's the biggest difference between you and Janice? Janice McGeehan, I'm sure they're talking about. That's my assumption. Um, so I, it would be much easier to probably identify the similarities, not, you know, um, because I think there's a lot of differences. But uh, Janice is a, uh, from what I understand, she's a business owner. Uh, so she has a business, either her or her husband have a business. I've been a business owner. And so we have that in common. Um, I think she believes in God. I believe in God. I would say the, the difference is, is for sure is the principles uh, that I stand on when it comes to government, uh, the purpose of government. Um, and then also my history of, of standing up for people's rights, uh, actually standing and defending people, putting myself at risk, um, you know, even causing myself a tremendous lot amount of suffering because I was willing to stand on principle and not yield. And, um, and also I, I hope that people will go to her website and look at her platform, look at what she is saying she's going to do, um, or what she's not going to do. And then go to mine, go to my keep Idaho Idaho plan and ask yourself, a couple of things. One is who is willing to fight for these things and actually get them done? Who's done that in the past? And two, are these principles and things that should be implemented in Idaho? And if they do that, then I think it'll be clear of what their decision should be. And I think ultimately that's probably the root of this question. Okay. Uh, this one's come up before, but Mike, Facebook says, are you going to legalize marijuana? <laughs> Well, I did speak at the Hemp Fest, actually, because uh, hemp, uh, you know, some people want to bleed that into marijuana. Uh, hemp is a, an amazing product that, for political reasons, and uh, was taken off the market and, um, and has, you know, has a, a, an enormous amount of benefit for, for people. Uh, medically and just supplies and so forth. In fact, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was written on hemp paper. And so, um, so anyway, there is there is that. But when it comes to marijuana, it's very simple. The state does not have jurisdiction over your body. And if I stand on another principle other than that, then I'm saying it's okay for the state to inject, you know, you with unknown substances it's okay for the state to make medical decisions for you. It's, it's okay for the state to force these things upon your children. The state does not have jurisdiction of what you put in your body and what you decide not to put in your body. And therefore, how can I stand on anything different than that? If you decide to put marijuana in your body, it is your choice. If, if for recreational reasons, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't do it. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do those things. I'm a good Mormon boy. And so... Uh, you know, it's not because I want to use marijuana. That's not my motive. I just understand the principle here, and that is the state does not have a jurisdiction over your body. You know, that may be one of the, going back to the prior one, what's the biggest difference between you, between you and Janice and that it's trying, I think, I think your platform is really trying to put government officials back in their lane. That's exactly right. They don't have, we didn't give them full reign of our everything in our lives. And so that principle is, is that way. And we already have laws. So if someone's intoxicated and causes harm or removes someone else's rights, we already have things on the books to address that. That's right. You're responsible for your actions. If you take in a substance that <laughs> causes you to, you know, not be in control of your body, you are responsible for that. And we have laws and measures that, that, that enforce that and 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 those things are in place and you're exactly right because you have on like one side if you will you have those that want to use the force of law to force people to do things like get vaccinated and then on the other side you have the same type of people but they're completely like different kind of belief set and so forth they want to use the force of law 
to stop you from getting vaccinated. Uh, or we can use it in comparison to like a business. Uh, businesses, they want, one side wants to force businesses to, you know, to get, to force their employees to get vaccinated. Another side wants to force businesses to not force their uh, 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 employees to get vaccinated. And I'm in the middle, if you want to call that in the middle, I don't know if you want to call it in the middle or not, but I believe that it's not the government's job, nor, nor their authority, nor their jurisdiction to tell a business owner who they can hire, what they can do, and so forth. And I know that's hard for people to understand, but it goes the same for an individual's rights to make their decision in their body, in their home, with their children, and all of those other things. There is a boundary that government must stay behind. And if you allow government to go over it, then you've just caused a tremendous problem. And that's what we're seeing in this country. Well, you're definitely principled on what you uh, what you go to stand on, right? You, you, you're not movable, which is what I think draws a lot of people to you. Um, next question. Let's see. This is, uh, I guess this is a Twitter one. The Action Jackson, IG. Um, what's your stand on illegal aliens? Um, from outer space, or are we talking about from another country, or are we talking let, about California's let, coming to Idaho? <laughs> let's let's stick with uh, the those coming to our nation. Okay, so like out of the country people, people that were born in another country or have citizenship in another country. And they want to come to the United States. Yeah, that's so, that's that's what my assumption yeah, is. Yeah, so I have answered this question many, many times uh, because people have accused me of being uh, like open border, like I want open borders. And that's not true. That's not, not correct at all. There are boundaries and there, again, there are jurisdictions that certain people have set, you know, our country and a nation have set. There's been wars that have have been fought and boundaries that have been purchased and land and so forth. And that those boundaries are there. And basically when you come across them, you come into a new law. Now the question is, is how open should they be and how should we allow people to come in and so on and so forth. And I look at it uh, as people coming to this con country, three types, because I think I, you could pretty much identify them as three types of people that are coming into this country or really into the state or any country when they're migrating in. And that is those that are looking for a handout. They want something, you know, for free or they want to live off somebody else and so forth. And, and in our case, our government, especially our federal government, offers so much. You, we're just attracting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to come into this country. To, the second type of person that comes here for criminal opportunity, like your cartel, or they look at a place like, you know, like Oregon right now or in California where you can actually steal a certain amount and they, the business owners can't call the, call the uh, police. So they go and they, they attra that attracts those who want criminal opportunity. And the third are those that are looking for freedom. They're fleeing from something, oppression, and they don't want a handout. They don't want criminal opportunity. They just want to be able to be free. They want to work. They want to prosper. They want to be good neighbors. And it's very uh, obvious of what of those three we want in our country. We don't want those coming in for handouts. So what's the solution? What's the solution? Pretty simple, right? Take it back. Yeah, you don't give a handout. You don't offer you know, all these programs and housings and food stamps and all of these things. You don't offer that. And then those people aren't attracted and they don't come. And second, your criminal um, justice system has to be functioning properly. And you have to truly find and prosecute the perpetrators for a true crime upon another individual. And if you get those two functioning right, where they're not, we're not giving handouts and our criminal uh, uh, system, justice system is working, you basically send a message to the rest of the world, don't come to the United States, don't come to Idaho. Don't come to the United States, you know, don't come to Idaho if, 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 I, if we implement it here in Idaho for a handout. They don't give handouts. And don't commit a crime in, in Idaho or the United States because uh, they're serious about that. You, you will have to, you'll be caught and you'll have to pay back your damages to the victim. And those are serious things. But if you want freedom and prosperity and if you want to be a good neighbor and you want opportunity 
well, then this might be a place for you. Now, well, I see it two ways because people say, well, too many people are moving into Idaho. And I, I agree. I hate to see Idaho just become so populated. It becomes like California or even the, even the East Coast or the West Coast, other states. Um, but what we see, what we'll see is the freeways. You'll see the freeway heading out with cars clear full of people that are heading to Oregon because they want their food stamps. And you'll see the freeway coming in uh, full, full of people who want to come here and work and be good neighbors. And that's what you'll see. And so, yeah, you're going to have people move in. You're going to have people move out. But I think by the policies of a state or a country, you can control what type and why are we not doing that? And that's what that was my you know issue with just saying let's build a wall. I just didn't think it was effective. I didn't think that it was it was going to be something that uh, was going to actually work. I mean, I get it. You know, people build walls all the time, but now these Mexican girls and these kids are having um, contests of how fast they can. Uh, climb this brand new wall that was built and cost billions and billions of dollars. And they're down to like 17 seconds. Uh, the, the way you stop immigration, the, the people we don't want coming in this country is by not giving handouts and your criminal justice system working properly. Okay. Long this is answer. A, this is Sorry. a long question. I'm going to break it up a little bit. Okay. It's from Cara Covington Ripley via Facebook. What are you seeing on the campaign trail in regards to the voters who are coming out to see you? Okay. Um, well, I'm seeing a huge variety of people, actually. Um, people that are, you know, come to check it out, you know. Uh, some people that are uh, have known my family and everything that happened at the Bundy Ranch in Nevada in 2014 and in Oregon. Um but I, I usually ask, you know, how many people have heard me before? And it's, it's typically around two-thirds of the people have never heard me speak before. And so we're getting new blood, new people to, to hear what I have to say. And then we have a lot of conversations after, and, I, and I'm constantly hearing, you know, a couple things. One is the media was wrong, completely wrong about you, um, and... I'm, you know, I, I hear people that came, didn't know who I was or didn't know about me, and now they're going to vote for me. And the other thing is, is I hear a lot of people say that they hadn't voted in years and they're going to vote now because I give them hope because I'm standing on correct principles. In fact, I just got two messages today, and I'll read them to you. Uh, actually, it came through uh, social media and so forth, so... Just to give you some encouragement, I have changed my mind about fully supporting Janice. I'm leaning heavily your way. You have been through the battles. You get it and defend the people. Of, uh, you get it and will defend the people of Idaho. You appear ready to take on the job for governor. I also wanted to compliment you on your public speaking. It has improved drastically through the practice on the campaign. Keep on fighting, Ammon. If you pull this off, it would be uh, put shockwaves through the Idaho good old boy system. That's much needed. Another one says, I randomly found myself at a meeting where Ammon Bundy was speaking. Want to know uh, something? I was pleasantly surprised. He is likable, smart guy who has fought like hell for individual liberties. And I will say anyone who has been wrongfully imprisoned by the federal government for two years is going to fight like hell to make sure you and I don't ever face the same fate. I appreciated both those. Um, I just got them today and seemed applicable for that question. I think those were great. I, I appreciate hearing that too. Um, that kind of mm -hmm. sums it. You, you answered the second half of that question. So um, on to page two, we're doing better <laughs> on getting to all your questions. Mm -hmm. Keep them coming in. Um, Okay, we've got this from Dale Jensen on Facebook. What does Idaho say, or when does Idaho say we are full? Water tables are dropping. Farmland is turning into subdivision. What point do we start to conserve the natural resources we have left? Well, I, I, as much as I can appreciate this and as much as I think that you know, people are concerned about it, including me, just with so many people moving in. Um, 
I, I grew up in a desert. Uh, you know, I watched Las Vegas have, you know, almost 2 million people and the water supplies are much, much less than up here. Um, so I don't necessarily think that, you know, Idaho is running out of natural resources. Uh, we had a dry year last year and, you know, hopefully this year, it looks like this year we're going to have a pretty good year, water supplies. And there's a, a lot of ways in which we can, you know, survive and preserve and so forth. Also, we have 63% of our land that's controlled by the federal government and 72% of our subsurface mineral rights that are, that are literally we are not able to even touch right now because the federal government won't let us. So I don't buy into the, that, you know, in a few years it's doomsday and we're all going to run out of water and food. I don't, I don't buy, I don't buy that. Um, and I've talked to before about, you know, uh, what we do to make sure the right people come in this country or into this state. And I think that just needs to apply. And I feel like, you know, we're not going to be able to stop people from moving in unless we build a wall around Idaho and start patrolling it. And we're not going to do that. That's, so we're going to have to attract the right people from coming here, those that want to work. Uh, we're going to need to get our land back from the federal government, our natural resources back from the federal government. And then, obviously, we always want to be conservative with our natural resources and responsible. So, I don't know. Did that answer the question? Um, uh, I'm going to say no. Okay. So, but, re rephrase it because I kind of okay. forgot the, the okay. gist of the whole question. So, when does Idaho mm -hmm. say we're full? Is, is there a point where you would say that that's the responsibility of the people here to say, hey, we're tapped out. This is an eight-bedroom well, hotel. Not, and we're not close to being tapped out. No way. I mean, just look at the land mass versus the amount of people. Um, and I don't I don't know that that is, you know, the authority of the state. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, there's no, there's been no other state that says, you know, so far we are able to move from state to state freely. And will that end at some point? Maybe. Um, uh, that's, you know, it's an is interesting thought, but we're certainly not there right now. Yeah. I think, I think, so I think you answered that then. I do think that that, this is stimulated Lisa question in my mind, right? I buy the phone that has the biggest storage on it. Cause I don't want to go through and delete phones or right. songs or music or pictures. <laughs> um, but even with at that, because of how we download and take pictures, they get filled up and I'm at the point now where I'm like, Shucks, I gotta go through and do that. So that's something we we uh, I, I I'm gonna think about a little bit more. And so we're certainly we're certainly facing some challenges because we're landlocked. With 37 percent is just private and state, right? And we're building on our on our agricultural land, right? And we we are right now destroying our agricultural land by building homes on it. When we have land that's perfectly suitable for building homes that is not agricultural land, mm -hmm. but the federal government won't let us build on it because they're unconstitutionally controlling it. Right. Also, housing costs are tremendous because of that. And even worse, we're our, our cities are becoming more densely populated, which has proven when that happens, you lose your conservative values and, and people begin voting more, you know, democratic, more liberal. And uh, we, so as a state, if we were to preserve our conservative, ide conservative identity, we have to build out, not build up. People so if I were to in. sum this up, you would say we're not – right now because we're constrained by the federal government, we are getting tight. But there's so much more resources, and that's already part of your Keep Idaho, Idaho plan. That's going to be your focus, which will make way for the people that do want to come that are the type of people that Idaho wants to attract. It, it is essential that we get our lands back uh, from the federal government. It is essential for, for Idaho. You, you cannot preserve a conservative state being packed into cities. Well, that's what happened to Nevada. That's what happened to Nevada. That's what happened to Oregon, Washington, Somewhat California, Colorado, these are all states where the federal government owns massive amounts of land and shove the people into the cities. And not only that, is like like our children, we, we have children that just got married, right? And they're facing the reality of never being able to own a home. If it's compared to the wages in, in Idaho versus the expense of a home, they're never practically going to be able to own a home. Or maybe they'll be able to own a home in 15, 20 years into their marriage. Right. But that's not what we want. That's not what Idaho wants. 
And that's the same problem. It's caused because of supply and demand issue. The federal government owns the, own the, owns the land. And then, uh, you know, there's the issue of you're not, we can't even pay our own bills. Idaho can't even pay our own bills. We have to get what's called payment in lieu of taxes, PILT, by the federal government so that we can pay our own bills. Because why? They're controlling our land and resources, which is wealth. And so there's, there's some major problems that have to be fought. And I just said, I've always ended this conversation, say, look, who's proven to fight this battle? There's been tons of politicians that said, we need to do this, and they've run on it, and they have no idea even how to do it. I've been generations fighting this fight. All right. Next one from Tom from Facebook. What or Who would you recommend voting for for lieutenant governor and attorney general and other positions to help you achieve your goals of eliminating fraudulent taxes that our corrupt government officials have created and eliminated the cesspool of corruption that is in our state of government? So great question. Uh, it's I think it's pretty easy for me to answer as far as lieutenant governor. That would be um, Priscilla Giddings. Um, as far as attorney general, that would be Raul Labrador. Um, we have like secretary of state coming up and, you know, there's something I've been doing a lot of research. I, I do a lot of research just because it's one, it's my nature, but also I want to be able to understand and know the, the principles that I'm speaking about. And when I do all the research of, of, um, governor Little's orders and the things that he, he did in 2020 and so forth and how we're still in executive order and, all of these things that actually I'll be speaking about some of these at, at our next virtual town hall. But Lawrence Denny, the Secretary of State, signed them all. He, you know, the governor signed them, and then he signed them. He certified them. Well, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I understand that it's probably the duty of the Secretary of State to, to certify the, the executive order, I, but I'd have a hard time certifying them. I'd have a hard time, you know, putting my signature on the bottom of those oppressive tyrannical orders where even 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 the um, orders where he is stripping parental rights when the se- when the state takes children away from from their families suspending parental rights for covid reasons um, I would have a hard time so you know I'm kind of on the fence with Lawrence Denny I, I you know I, I just don't like that he just hasn't kind of made a stand and so there's other people running. Uh, Dorothy Moon is running. She's mad at me right now. Love you, Dorothy. I know you're mad at me, but uh, I still love you. I still respect you. And I know that she's running for Secretary of State. And I think all in all that she she would probably be really honest and really thorough about making sure that election integrity was, was upheld. And so I think I'd have to go with uh, Dorothy Moon for Secretary of State. All right. Um, Tiffany from Facebook, you're running against some strong candidates. My question is, do you think one of you can truly get enough votes to beat Brad Little? Or with so many running, won't this just split the vote, allowing Little to be reelected by the liberal population here? Yeah, if if I didn't think that we could beat Brad Little, and if I didn't statistically no, we could do that, then I wouldn't be in the race. Um, there are some benefits to, st- you know, being in a race just to be in a race. Um, uh, there's, but it, you know, does not outweigh the, the negatives at all. I mean, I would rather just go home with my family, take care of my family. Uh, you know, we've known each other for a long time. I mean, I, I would much rather build another business up, start making some money. I got some properties I'd like to develop. I mean, there's a, hundred things that I would rather be doing than running for governor. But I believe it is the right thing to do. I believe that we can win. I, I entered this race to win. And statistics have shown us over and over and over where we are, we've passed Janice McGeehan and we're gaining on Brad Little. And so we're going to keep doing it until something else makes sense, uh, until we feel directed or, or, or statistically things add up differently. We're going to keep doing it. And, um, uh, just kind of give you a, a, a figure, Brad Little's base and support has actually decreased. Janice has increased by 4% since she announced in May 2021. And I've increased since August by 23% in support. And so it's just a matter of 
you know, math, the matter of momentum and matter of working our butts off. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. And then the last one for this uh, podcast. Let's see. This is from Austin. What do you do in case another Ruby Ridge incident occurs? And what is your ideal way to handle agencies like ATF, BLM, and the Forest Service? That's a great question. And I have, you know, lived that. I've lived that before. I have seen where a Ruby Ridge situation came upon my family. And, you know, we appealed to the, to the sheriff, and he said he was going to take a neutral position which when you have the federal government come against the a small family, ranching family, uh, that's not a neutral position. You know, when you allow the federal government and you step back as a, as a sheriff, and we're talking about he's a sheriff over basically Las Vegas or Clark County, and the, uh, Las Vegas uses a sheriff for their metropolitan policing. So he has 1,800 deputies, over 1,800 deputies. He could have easily protected my family, and he should have, and he knew he should have. He knew we were right, and we have documentation from him in our discovery before and after where he knew that we, we were in the right position, but he didn't do it because he receives a tremendous amount of money from the federal government, and so he didn't want to, you know, cut off the hand that basically was supplying with lots of money. That was the federal government. So, um, and then we saw where the state, we called on the state, we called on the governor, and they basically made a statement saying we don't like what the federal government's doing, but they just left us out there to defend for ourselves. And ultimately we had to appeal to the American people and enough people came and then saved my family's life. And I, I don't say that lightly. The American people came and saved my family's life. They would have killed us just like Ruby Ridge or Waco. They would have wiped us out and then said we were some crazy, you know, people that resisted the government, which was nothing to Nothing even close to the truth. We have deeded rights with the state of Nevada, 11 of them, grazing rights. They're deeded. We've borrowed against them, traded them, inherited them back and forth. They're real property. And the federal government wants to come and say that, they, that, that we don't own them. And we had an issue with that. And the state wouldn't stand. The county wouldn't stand. The sheriff wouldn't stand. Finally, my dad said, I'm not letting them go. And the people come and stood around us. Now, as governor, what I will do is I will not allow that to happen. I will stand in between the people and their rights and the federal government. That is the purpose of a state. The founders designed it so that there's checks and balances and that the state is supposed to balance the federal government and the federal government is supposed to balance the state. And what is they, what are they balancing them on? On the protection of the individual's rights. And that's what I will do as a governor. And, you know, I've done that personally at very high expense to myself and my family. Uh, and I intend on using the state's resources to do that, and I believe that we are going to have to do that soon with administrations like the Biden administration. They have no respect for individual rights, the right to religion, the right to assemble, the right to speak. All of those have been violated um, just in this last few years, and it is absolutely crucial that we get in control of the state of Idaho to protect the rights of the people and I intend on doing that, and that is my, my number one reason for running. Okay. Well, I like those answers. Hopefully you guys like them too. Don't forget, there's a lot of information on VoteBundy.com. Uh, the Keep Idaho, Idaho plans there. You guys can get all the Ammon's unique where he's actually put out what he's going to do. It's not a typical political candidate move because then we can go, you said, but that's the type of guy he is. It's the candidate. He's, you can go see what he says he's going to do before you vote for him. You don't have to sign the bill to, to see what's in it with this guy. So anyways, thanks for joining us. We'll be back probably in a week. Our goal is to be weekly. Send us your questions. And uh, well, until next time, have a great day. Thank you.